Tonight, I'm finishing up this wall and the birch reflector panel that will go over that absorber. There's the frame. And here's the panel. I still have to do some sanding and then I'm gonna lacquer it. And then I'll take the frame. It'll get mounted above this absorber. Insulation will go in and then I'll put the birch over the top. And then I have four pieces of trim that will go over that absorber to finish it off. And then it's done. It's time to do a couple tweaks to the setup, specifically over in this rack right here. I'm gonna move a few pieces of gear around because I'm adding another 500 rack, as well as four or five new pieces of gear that are gonna be here, which I'm really excited about. But first, I've gotta move a few things around. The Mix Bus, which is the C1, the 542s, and the SSL Ultraviolet, which are in the Fredenstein rack are gonna get moved into that four space rack and put on top of this rack and then the reel to reel will go above that. In place of this, I'm putting another Trident Decadent 10 space. I've got some goodies in here. Ooh, what is it? And a couple others that are behind me that I'm not gonna show you first. They're gonna go in this rack as well as the 551. So this will all be kind of recording and mixing gear. And then I'll have my mix bus over there easily accessible so I can actually stay more in the center of the speakers in the sweet spot while I'm mixing. The new rack is in. I'm gonna have a space open for a little while. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do there. I have a couple things I might add eventually, but for now it's going to be an open space. I have a new snake for eight channels of this. Then the last two channels are gonna be mic pre's and then this rack, I still have another, I think three channels that I left open in, in a snake because I do have some room down here to add some more gear too. I can still expand on this side, but I'm gonna cover a lot of ground with this rack. And I love these Trident Decadence. Built like a tank and no power issues. Looking good. Really excited to check out these high lows. Been wanting to use them for a while. Classic 80 BEQ. And of course the good old Rupert Neve gear. This right here, that's a nice rack. And now it's time to finish this one. Gotta move all this stuff up here first. And then I'll get it placed up there, wired up. Mix bus chain is moved over to my left above the effects rack. It's gonna be a lot easier to stay in the sweet spot right here and just reach over there. But that stuff doesn't change that often, so it's mostly set it and forget it. Kind of little tweaks here and there with the 542s, but that's about it. And this rack over here is in. And we are done for tonight, ready to mix tomorrow. Now that all that's done, the fun part starts. I have a bunch of mixing coming up, so I'm gonna get to use all this stuff right away, and I'm looking forward to seeing how it all sounds. So go make some music. <laughs> What's happening, everybody? Hello. How's everybody doing? Looking back, making sure we have audio. All right. Holy crap. We've already had a day. 
Uh, man, so welcome back to the studio. Hope everybody's doing fantastico. We're doing good, I think. Oh yeah, I mean, talk <laughs> about a setup. We have, uh, to today is gonna be interesting. It's gonna be fun, but it's gonna be a little bit interesting, I think, as well. But first off, before we get to that part, uh, our set, I wanna go through just a few things first off with the audio side of things. This setup today is by far the most complicated thing we've ever tried to make work. We're even having to use a different system for our labs, which is going through the camera with the DJIs. So if the audio is a little wacky, let us know. It's a little harder because the whole console is being used for the mix, so we don't have the normal control that we have. We've been testing it, it's been working, but just to let everyone know there, uh, it's a completely new system and workflow to make this video work, so we're a little on edge here to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> a little is, is an understatement. Uh, second, coming up hopefully this week, if I get the video finished, if I'm not mistaken, your audio, you got the audio yeah. done, right? We have the next big mic test video on the way. This time it's acoustic guitars. We did how many mics? 20? Yeah, at least nine, yeah, 20. 19 yeah. or 20, and then there were a few that were multi patterns so we went ahead and grabbed a sample of each of those in each of the patterns, which was very, very enlightening. And honestly, we wouldn't have done that had we not done the Roswell Virtual Showroom the, the week before we filmed all that when we had the Delphos 2 in figure eight. So that's on the way. I've got a finished video. He's got the audio done. My goal is to have that out this week sometime, either be Tuesday or might be Friday. Not sure. We'll get there. So, okay. We had any complaints yet? Uh, no. I'll give them a complaint email that they can send emails to if there are complaints. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like uh, usually people say hi, but now it's like, it's like we got crickets on the chat. So, like, uh, like screen crickets, it's like a black screen. We need a sound, a, a cricket sound sample, so you know we can just turn it on when there's just nothing like, going. Just have crickets. I mean... <laughs> okay, so let's let's kind of dive in. Here's what we got cooking up today. We have an EP Christmas songs, a Christmas EP, an EP Christmas songs, a Christmas EP. Let's see if I can say that any more <laughs> convoluted, right? We uh, did this EP a long time ago, way before this studio was even a thought. I want to say the first one song we did like 2007 maybe ish, yeah. give or take, right in that area. And then we, you know, with the years right after that, we kind of trickled in a few more tunes. Uh, they, it had been released. It's it's off everything now. You know, some of those mixes were really old, and we were just listening back to them, going, "Man, that stuff doesn't sound good." You know, we'd like to remix some of that. I keep trying to get him each year, you know, to record some new ones and he smartly refuses. <laughs> <laughs> so this year we decided, since we have these songs that we really liked the arrangements of, that we would just, we'd remix all this stuff to make it better and to, to get it where we wanted it to be. And we're working with sessions that were recorded in a very small room not necessarily at a time when we were really looking for sounds up front. At least in the drums, it was just, can we get a just a good drum sound? Whether or not it was the right vibe or anything, that was not even in our, or at least in my thought process in those mid-2000s. You know, it was at the beginning of a lot of the mics we had. I want to say the kit was a lot of MXLs, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. I think the toms were the cubes. Overheads would have either been... B67Gs, like the green ones, or what else were we using? Yeah. I, can't, I can't remember. And unfortunately, I don't have any video from that period either. And I looked for some photos, and I couldn't find any that were definitively from these recordings. I found some other ones, but the setup, who knows? I know the kit was my old Pearl Session kit. but So basically, we're, we decided to remix these and kind of release them is new and we figured since we're doing that it would make a fun console side chat we've done some recording we've done a lot of talking so why not you know do it mix it the day before and and just kind of go through the tune because they are fun arrangements i think mm -hmm. oh. you know well yeah 
Big so, time arrangements. So that's what we're doing. We're really just gonna, we've, we've got a mix up here. It's close to being done. Probably maybe tweak it a little bit right now or maybe not. Maybe we'll finish it tonight and then print it out and then release it. He'll do a mastering job on it and get it out this week. We may do one next week, uh, one more next week. I don't know yet. We'll see how it goes first. But that's what we're doing here. So it's we've got these Christmas tunes. We thought it'd be fun just to have a console side chat with uh, a mix up. We have cameras everywhere that we normally don't have. Yeah. You can probably see one in that shot over there that's above this rack. We have the GoPro on the console. There's another one above this rack, and I have another camera over here to the side on this rack. There's a lot new. This and and on top of that, just to let you know the setup. This computer is controlling some stuff with the outboard effects via a MIDI timepiece. I am also synced to the print machine over here. And there's one other sync that some of you will probably notice at some point. Uh, we'll talk about that later. But this, it, it's quite a complicated setup. There's a lot of in and out on this computer. I'm not anticipating any mistakes, but I do know that when we were doing sound check about 20 minutes before we went live, the Apogee was dropping a little bit on the print machine, which is a super easy fix. I have screen sharing on this computer so I can control that one. So if it happens, we'll just deal with it as we go. <laughs> and that's kind of where we're at. So that's the setup. So why don't we, what should we do first? Should we just take a little listen to some stuff? Yeah. Should we just listen down one time? And yep. we'll flip through some of the cameras and let you just see what some of the, the stuff that's happening. Okay, so let me, let me get over here. Where's my count off? Make sure the Apogee is going right now. Nope. Oh, I don't know why that's doing that. Poor audio being a little bit of a pain today. Okay, now we should be going. There we go. All right, there we go. That's the tune. <laughs> you gotta love Christmas songs, man. Especially Jingle Bell Rock. That is our good buddy, Brian Hacksaw Williams on vocals. Minnow Verbotten, you all know him, on bass. We had Nicole Carson on background vocals and Aubrey Buchanan, both of them rock. And that's, that's the setup. So one last thing, we could not get our old trusty 2009 tower 
to sync up to the switch. It won't spit any audio or audio. It won't spit any any video out. So I can't show you the screen. We have a few screenshots that we can pull up, but mm -hmm. I will say that there are very few plugins going. Really a few logic channel EQs just to clean up some stuff. I am using the tiltration. Actually, do you want to just pull up the the screenshot of Let's see. Oh, we'll get to that one in a second. Next, keep going, keep going. One more. Yeah, start with that one. Okay. And here I'll cut you in. So your camera three. So this, there's our drums. That's what you're looking at there, obviously. Drums are always red. So a little bit of the gain plug-in, which is literally just pulling uh, some volumes down because we were a little toasty on some volumes back in the day. A little channel EQ. You'll see on the kick drum, I think you can see it there, I am using a sample, which is a sample from a pack I'm getting ready to release. I'm using Slate Trigger for that. I couldn't get the original kick drum to feel the way I wanted. So it's like an 80-20 blend. And go to, the, go to the next one now. But you can see there's not a whole lot of plugins going on. Okay. All right, so now there's some bass, guitar, and you can see the organ in there. And the same thing there. There's just, it's mainly a little bit of gain here and there. The organ has a little bit of the tiltration on it from Trident. There's some DSing on the vocals. I think there's one more screenshot, right? Or is that, nope, that's all I took. Okay, yeah, so there's yeah. the, that's on the organ, which we'll, we'll get to when we get there. And mm -hmm. then there's a little, the same thing a little bit on the background vocals. But that's it. All right, we'll cut back to us. Man, this is... <laughs> it's going to click different buttons to try to get somewhere so that's it for plugins everything is being done outside the box we kind of set out to do that and kind of didn't it was more once we decided that we wanted to like show this as a console side chat we knew and we tested out and realized that we couldn't hook up this computer to the switch to see anything we're like okay we need to try to do something in a manner that it's easy to show, so we have cameras on everything. But also it became a challenge, that can, how much can we do with just the limited gear here to try to tweak this old recording? So let's take a listen. I'm just gonna start going through some stuff. If, you, if anybody got any questions, who's here? Okay, so now that uh, finally the chat showed up, I just had to do some refresh, whatever. Oh man, see, yeah. we got a lot. <laughs> but, you know, uh, obviously some people already uh, saw the, the obvious. Saw what? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> the obvious, you know, those colored things that, that you can kind of see there. Don't so. know yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. So here's all I'm going to say about what I don't know what you're yeah. saying. <laughs> We're in beta testing. It's getting close. Still working a few things out. But uh, I've been lucky to work with these guys again on some new stuff. And I will say it is cool and it's going to be really cool once it's all done. So I'm going to, when that day comes and that day is not today, I will go through all of that. But yeah, you'll see some, you know, hopefully things moving correctly uh, today. So yes, it's been, it's been fun to work. <laughs> you know, is there, is there, is there, you know, the, is there, I mean, you guys are quick, man. <laughs> You know? Yes, it is on the way. It's, yeah. Um, weird. Like so, I said, I'm lucky to get to work with them again on some, you know, beta testing this stuff and, and checking yeah. it out. And I'm super excited about this. Still a few uh, yeah. tweaks to do here and there, but it's getting really, really close. Yeah. And it's going to be freaking awesome. Yeah. In, in a way, we're doing like Microsoft, who kind of shows you that something is happening, yes. but they don't tell you everything, right? We can do an Apple here because, you know, you guys obviously are seeing it. So, <laughs> But unlike Microsoft, when this comes out, it will work. <laughs> I think I just made all the PC people mad. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. We'll no, spark it. But I mean, you, you cannot hide it. I no. Mean, Jesus. I know. You know, once it, once it went in, I was like, oh, you know, we kind of scheduled these mix things but anyway that's all i'm going to say about that today yeah it's cool it's getting there it's going to be it already is awesome uh, especially with getting to do a different workflow a little bit but that's one of as you guys if you saw the intro video you saw that, that some things have moved around there's additions over here in this rack things moved over to this rack there's this 
The MIDI timepiece uh, uh, is finally all working with all the outboard, which we're, I'm going to go through all of that stuff today. So there, this is probably, at this point, feels to me like a very complicated setup because my head is still really having to think about things. Yeah. I think I've called him like five times this week going, dude, I'm in, I'm in like tech brain yeah. when I need to be creative. But it's all getting there, so it's, you know, we're going to live or die by the sword here and do this yeah. on a live stream. <laughs> yeah, just to be clear, because they're asking this, these tracks were recorded in the old studio. So yes. uh, nothing was done here. We just remixing everything based on what we recorded in the old yeah. studio. I think this song was done in 2007 or 2008. And I'm going to I'm going to solo some stuff up here. So let's just let's start with the drums and you can hear let me put my headphones on so I can hear what's going on. Wow, we got people from Luxembourg. Look at that. Fantastic. So, okay, so I'm just gonna, well, let me make sure the, mo the, the Apogee is being a bit of a pain today. Oh, I'm at the end of the. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I can, I can tell you from here. Nope, nope. it's acting up. Yeah, the Apogee is dropping signal. So hold on, let me refresh core audio on the other machine. Of course, the one thing that actually hasn't been a problem is a problem right now, so yeah. all right. Why are we not going? Um, oh, I know why. <laughs> because it's muted. <laughs> Get play on the wrong computer. I'm gonna go to the bridge where some toms are happening here. All right, come back to us on seven. So that's that, there's the basic drum sound, and I don't know if you guys can hear, but you hear a little bit of Brian in in the background on that. When we track this in the old studio. The whole studio was one room smaller than this control room. I had the, the drums were in this corner. Ernesto was probably over by where the computer was in another corner with either going direct or the axe track. Was it that with that little speaker? The No. Just direct? Uh, yeah, just whole direct track. and then we reamped it. Right. So there was that, and then Brian would have been in the opposite corner of me with just a uh, we might have put a baffle around him, I don't know, singing guide vocals so we knew the arrangement. Because we did all these arrangements probably in about a half an hour, the overall arrangement. So that's the drums. That's the old session kit. Don't remember the mics. I know the cubes are probably on the tom. It was an MXL A55 on the kick, which I was not happy with how it sounded. Uh, I don't know if it's the mic's fault necessarily. It was probably more of my recording lack of prowess at the time. Yeah, did you use a 57 in the snare? Most likely it was a 57 on the snare, because I think yeah. that time period was yeah. all, we were using 57s pretty much on the snares. Overheads, I'm going to guess a set of the, the V67 or 67G, the green sets of MXLs. There were a lot of MXLs in mm -hmm. that part. Time. So what the, what's going on with the drums here? I'm going to see if I can, let me just shut the drum bus off. I have no idea what's going to happen now. Where is the off? Okay, out, out out so this is just the drum bus is the rupert neve 535 compressors yeah. Which, oh yeah what is that there. uh what is it five five so it's here so you can actually yeah point at it so right here the rupert neve 535 compressors they're feeding into the 551 eq and then i'm ending up over there with the diy re and i have a little bit of the royal blue happening this guy. yep so I turned all that stuff off, and let's hear what's going on here. I'm just going to go back to verse. So 
So that, not doing a whole lot there, just adding a little bit of size to it, a little bit of thickness there. But a lot of the main stuff is happening on the, yes, are you still on that camera? Okay, yeah. cool. So what we have happening here is this SSL, this EDIN is on the kick. And even though I may mostly sample, I'm still using a little bit of the expander just because some of what was coming in around that kick mic was not fun and it was hard to get away from. So it just tightens it up. And I like the way this sounds and the sample I'm using is not overly compressed. So I'm just treating it like a regular kick. The snare, and that this is going to Trident EQ after that on the board only a little bit, which we'll look at in a sec. The snare is going through the Electra, which is new. This is only my second mix using the Electra on, on anything really. And I'm, it's, I'm getting to know it, but so far I'm really digging it. The toms are doing two things. They're going, what am I doing first? Tone Lux, a little bit of compression, and then they're feeding these two sound sculptors because they were a little lacking in body. And I wanted to try to see, go back over to seven real quick. Seven? Yeah. And what I wanted to try to do was see if I could get some, a little bit of body, round them off, and there's a little bit of the way those cubes handle some of the uh, like high end attack that I didn't like. I wanted to see if we could do it with, you know, some outboard gear. And I actually dig kind of how that sounds. And then the toms are getting a tiny bit of EQ. Can you, here, I'll, I'll get it. You keep doing that. Mm -hmm. Oh, we lose the GoPro again. Oh, man. Let's see if we get it back. The there colors will probably be all jacked up. Yep, okay, whatever. The color is gonna be jacked, but this thing keeps going off, even though it's set not to. Um, I need to reverse that thing. So anyway, here, let me connect to this camera again. So I got the handy phone so I can connect to the GoPro. A lot, a lot of connections going off. No, I don't wanna rate you. You keep turning off. Um. Where is the reverse? Auto rotation, bottom. All right, go over to four. four. Let's go to the, yeah. There we go. It's gonna be a little on the yellow side, a little dark. Let me see if I can get that a little bit brighter. Uh, that's a little better, we'll deal with that. Okay, so the kick, Coming up right over here, it's getting a little bit of the Trident EQ, pulling a little bit of low mid, pushing a little bit of high mid, but just a little bit. Uh, the, the sample kind of already had a pretty good sound, and then I like, you know, down the road what all the processing did. Snare getting no EQ here. These inserts on these are not pre-EQ inserts. The overheads are getting some... Am I doing any EQ right here? No, I'm just rolling off bottom. The, what's on here is the successor. Right, right over here to the right. We'll look at that in a second. That's on the overheads. Toms are right here, getting a little bit of EQ. I'm pulling a little bit of low mid out of it, pushing a little bit of high mid and high. I guess I'm a pusher. Uh, there's two sets of rooms, but I'm only using one. That room we used to have didn't sound good at all. So let me see if I can just pull that up. Let me see. No kick out. You're down. You're down. So here... Yeah, I can't. That's the other thing is with this setup, I don't have a great way to solo. So let me do go to the verse. Oh, the apogee. This is going to be a pain in my butt today, this apogee. Come on, baby. There we go. A very unremarkable room sound. Turn everybody back on. So what I'm doing with that, we'll move through this a little bit quickly. So the I took those rooms and I split them. Let me go to the bridge here. Let's see that they come up because I'm automating them to only come on on the bridge.
and you can hear, I'll turn the compressor off, which is a, what do I have on here, a dynamite? So I got the dynamite. What am I doing in here? Oh, I'm not doing a whole, I'm pulling some low mid and that's the only EQ I'm doing. The rest of that tone is purely coming from trying to blow it up with the dynamite, just to make it a little more interesting. Again, to see if I could get a little bit of ambience without. I mean, there are a couple things here. And then I'm augmenting that. So here it is again, drums only. Actually before, yeah, here I'll finish this. So I'm augmenting the sound. There's a snare and the toms are going to a good old fashioned MIDI verb. And then the snare gets a little bit of the TC M3000. So there, there's a reason why we did a lot of this on the drums. So I'll, we'll get to one sec. I want to just play this kick drum. I'm going to turn this trigger off. On. So this, this kick drum, here, let me just mute everybody real quick. Kick with no... with the trigger, with the sample. So there's some more mids in that sample. And there's a little, there's like a fair amount between, I don't know, like around 700, 800 hertz that has a little bit of that paper, which helps it cut, in my opinion, once we're in context. We all back on here. We back on everybody. Now, let's turn, oh, so here's the final drum sound. I hear Brian in my right ear. Yeah, yeah, he's there. <laughs> so the routing on this, all the drums, one through six, which is kick, snare, overhats, toms, ride, and hi-hats. Coming over here to bus one and two, we still on there? I have some parallel compression with the set of the Comp 54s here on the right on ch uh, bus three and four. And then the rooms are going out just the main, uh, the main mix. There's enough compression going on that I didn't want to sizzle them anymore. Here, cut back to us real quick. I want to set one thing up. So one, conceptually, when we started doing this, one thing we wanted to have was we didn't want aggressive. It's a rock tune for sure, but we didn't want it to feel like a heavy rock tune. And I wanted to push the drums just behind everything a little bit so they weren't, they can be loud, especially the snare, but it doesn't necessarily feel like it's just bam right here, aggressive, like screaming at you the whole time. We wanted it to be a little, a little more Huey Lewis and a little less, uh, name a heavy band that's aggressive. I don't know. <laughs> Something else, anything heavy. You know, so, so we're using some of the reverbs just to help a little bit of wash, a little bit of space, and then the guitars, bass are dead dry, bone dry. So we get automatic separation that way. So anyway, that's, that's what we were thinking conceptually when we were working on this. So well, what should we do next? We got any questions? Uh, nope. Oh yeah, so you Oh yeah, Sean, that. was the kick mic recorded with EQ during tracking or was it mostly mic placement? God, that's a... Good, very good question. I mean, this is like it, it that that time period we moved through some gear pretty quickly, through a, a couple sets of Onyx, the eight channel mic pre's, and we moved into the Allen and Heath. Con the the, the GL twenty four hundred, I think it yeah, was the twenty four channel. Would be on a budget, right, yeah. budget. That thing is great. So if if it was that, there might have been a little bit of EQ going. But I'd say the majority of what we did wasn't. So that kick drum, 
to me was a little bit muffled. I probably had a little bit too much stuff in there. I was, I would say my tuning probably wasn't where it should be. And I was trying to get rid of some excess, like that resonance that were happening. And I probably did that with a little dampening, which made it feel a little bit on the tight side and a little bit dry. And then that MXL mic has a lot of like the 2K, 2.5K, like probably 1.5 to 2.5K in it, which can be a little sharp sometimes and a little bit nasally or make it feel a little bit nasally. And I didn't like that. In context, it didn't have, it had punch, but it didn't have any width. And I wanted a kick drum that had a little bit of width, so it had a little bit of size, and then we could tuck it in just a little bit. So to answer your question, not exactly sure. I'm going to lean on no EQ, but I'm not, I'm not 100% certain on, on that. Yeah. So. Okay, here's a big question. Uh -oh. So um, could you please detail your hybrid setup a bit for mixing on the console? How do you get your console mix back into your DAW? Are you just recording stamps or all the channels back into your DAW? Okay, that is a huge question and a fantastic question. Let me go through the other instruments. We'll circle back to that because I do want to go over that because of some of the things that are happening over here and the connectivity. I will get, who was yep. that? That was uh, Gilles from uh, Luxembourg. That's fantastic. I'll get back to that in a second. So let, let's move through our other instruments because we get to the stuff that actually I think at the time were, were better recordings. And I'm going to start with... The bass. Oh, there's some perc Oh, we got to go through the sleigh bells. We'll go through that last. Yeah. Okay. So, good old fashioned minnow verboten. Good old bass. And guess what? Apogee. Yeah. Come on, baby. Light my fire. So the bass is, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's probably the same exact bass he's used on the Songs from the Studio mm -hmm. videos this year. It's the same amp that we used, I don't want to turn around, and probably the last one, which is his SVT, oh, I got the lid on and I can't see it. I think it's a 400 and his Wizard Cab. I'm pretty sure that's what, because we did not do the, the, when we did the arrangement, it was Brian, Ernesto, and I in the room doing that. And Minnow came over later and did all the bass, so we would have mic'd it up. No idea what mic we used. I don't even have any notes in here. I wasn't smart. Well, wait, hold on. Do I have any? Nope. Nope. No notes. I, don't, I can't even venture a guess yeah. what it would have been at that time. I don't know. But it sounds like Minnow. That's the thing about Minnow is that rig sounds so good that even that long ago, it sounded really nice. I'm doing a couple things to it. It's going to the warm audio, the Revive modded WA-76 to just even out a hair. And then that is feeding a Tone Lux TX-5C. No, that is feeding the Sound Sculptor TS-500. TX-5C is on the toms. The TS-500, one thing I like about that Sound Sculptor especially for anything that has low end, kick drum, toms, bass especially, is it adds a little bit of extra something on the bottom without EQing, uh, but it is a little on the dark side. So for bass, it's great because what we're losing at the top isn't there anyway. You know, for other things like a full drum bus or something, it gets a little weird because it, the upper mids, like four or five K, getting into your high end is less. That doesn't affect the bass. And that compressor, Minnow was really, really. Here, can you go over to? Let's see if we can uh, five. Shot. Go to right? six. No, go to six. I don't know if we'll be able to see the needles moving here. Oh, six. Yeah. yeah. So it's just you know two to three dB. Uh, Fast release and a medium to slow attack. You know, I think, what am I, about a seven on, on the attack right there. So I'm, I'm not trying to squash it. Didn't need to. Minnow's ridiculously good. Bass tone is great right from the source, so I'm not going to do too much. And the sound sculptor not hitting ridiculously hard. It's just enough to kind of add a little size. 
Then there's a second channel that I actually split in the in logic and sent out to the base parallel compression that's getting blended a little bit. That is going down here to a dynamite. Here, let me see if I can move this camera. Okay. Um, probably um, not focus. David's saying there's some crackling on, on, on your audio. Oh, uh, is it on Ernesto's too, though? I know. I mean, uh, David is just saying, is it, is it on mine too? Well, I mean, it should yeah. be. I mean, yeah. Here, I'm not, we'll leave that. I mean, we're going to have to fix that. Put this back there. All right. Right. David, is it happening completely? Is he saying yes? Yes. On all, on all audio. audio. All right, hey, guys, give me 15 seconds. We'll be right back. I need that mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, hopefully, go to OBS. That is an issue, not been able to figure out, and it's been very frustrating. Let me know if that's better. Okay, so yeah, so you're back. Yeah, we should be back now, so let me know if that audio is better. Hopefully we got our crackling out of there. So anyway, that, that's the bass tone. So, yeah, bass and drums. We're good? All right, excellent. Let's get to the guitar. So, I'm gonna let you do you remember what you used exactly? Uh, yeah, if, if memory serves correctly, I used a Framus Dragon head with the corresponding Dragon 4x12 cabinet. And it was set, you know, like crunch, I think. And uh, the Framus Les Paul type uh, humbucker guitar, uh, that's, that's probably what I used. So it's yeah, they kind of like less Paul, less polish, less Paul, less polish, less polish, less polish, less polish, less polish. What? Less polish, like less polish from like it's polishing. <laughs> All right, here, let's take a listen yeah. to that. Let me go to the verse. So there's the guitars. We are doing a little bit to them. There's three things happening. On the insert on the channel, they're going through a pair of Comp 54 Mark III's, which I love on guitar. Actually, anything that has cool mid-range, they're just great. The compression is like barely. It's a two to one. It's a fast release. It's just tickling really, but it's more just for the, what they do a little in the tone getting a little bit of Neve 8803 EQ. And the last thing is you can see, hey, real quick, Ernesto, flip yeah. to camera uno. One. Did you have to translate for me? Is that one? <laughs> <laughs> okay, see up here, this guy, this good old. ART? Yes, and unfortunately, I will not be able to solo that up, but. Here, I'll turn it off. Two. On. Off. All right, come back over to seven real quick. Seven? Yeah. There you go. And we need to make sure that computer has enough charge. Yep, so I'll, I'll move that over. Yeah. So that here, here's what I've been playing with, and this is some... I think you may have seen this if you watched a couple of the other mix videos of the last songs from the studio. 
but this I've been playing around with this a lot is like a parallel saturation type thing. There's two settings on this that I actually really like, and I'm hitting it somewhat hard, enough to like get the circuit to start, you know, doing something. And then there's a, an electric guitar setting, which is basically, you know, it's got these e, kind of like EQ settings, right? It's just these switches that are kind of tonally shaped. There's that, and there's a vocal one that's warmer. So sometimes instead of reaching for an EQ to get it thicker, or an EQ to get it brighter, the first thing I'll do is I'll go to that, I'll blend it in a little bit just to where I hear it kind of things a little, and then I'll flip between those settings, ooh, brighter, you know, warmer, thicker, and see which one feels better. Still developing that a little bit, but it's been, it's been, uh, I, I'm happy with the way it's going so far, because it adds some stuff to the, uh, the sound without like sounding like you EQ'd it. And it's not compression, so you never hear it really grabbing. Well, it is a form of compression, but you never really hear it grab, grab. That thing go out? Yeah. Man. Oh, there we go. Come on, baby. Uh. Don't <laughs> fail us now. We got too many computers going. Literally. One, two, three. We got four machines. Yeah, it's a lot. There we go. So that's something that I've been playing around with a lot on guitars. And all of these guitars are, are going to it, except for, I think the jazz guitar is the only one that's not, which is that little breakdown. Oh, let's hear that real quick, actually. Let's go to our breakdown, jazz, baby. And that one's overdriving. <laughs> So that's the only one that I'm not pushing over into that, actually. I don't think, anyway. Oh, I am. See? Didn't even know. I'm pushing it there already, so. And that one, you can hear, we're overdriving that one a little bit. It's probably how hard we're hitting the Topanga, which I love doing, because in context, let me pull that in, some drums so, and bass. Is the Topanga in the shot, if anyone uh, wants to see it? Yeah, I think it is. If you go to camera uh, six. Six. This guy right here. Yep. Oh, I'm in the wrong section. Let me get to the jazz. So yeah, that's the guy. So yeah, so that's, that's that little guy. Yeah, that's just a fun little breakdown right there. So, and that's all, oh, guitar solo. How can we forget the guitar solo, man? It's the best part. Yeah, with a wah pedal in the second half. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Okay, so let's bring everybody back on for our rhythm section. Oh, wait, hold on. I got to bring the jingle bells in the organ oh. in. Did so you we mention the an EVQ in the guitars? Yeah, I went through that. Okay, cool. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we showed it, but we, we can yeah. show it. Yeah. The, one thing I'm going to say, the 80, Neve 8803. So that's... Uh, yeah, flip that? over to six. camera six, yeah. A little okay we got enough light this eq right here i absolutely love on guitars great on snare it just it doesn't always necessarily have a sound itself it's fairly on the clean side but it's so versatile and it's great for pulling out uh, something in sounds that are distorted just a little bit of it just to make them cut a little more without sounding like it's eq'd plus you have full control over your width Frequency is fully sweepable on every channel. You've got high and low cuts. It's great. And it has recall software, which is awesome to take snapshots. And it's great even in the middle of the mix. Yesterday when we were mixing, it's like, yeah. okay, you like that, but I want to try something. Save that snapshot, change it up. Oh, didn't like that. Recall that snapshot. Bam, you're right back. Absolutely love that EQ. Really, really, really nice. Digging it. So last thing on our rhythms and we're gonna do some vocals and then I'll go through the whole like setup, which, no, we'll get to there in a second. So we got a little organ happening here. And this is fake organ. This is not a uh, real organ. Real quick, bring that screenshot up. I am doing outside, out here. I'm doing a little bit of EQ just to EQ it around the guitar, so uh, so it should be a tiltration that says organ. Uh, 
that's the vocal one, I think. That one, right this there. This one. Yeah, okay. cut that in real quick so you so can see. So we are on three. Yep. There you go. So this, and the only thing I'm using here, if you look on the right where it says saturation, that's the only thing I'm doing is pushing that a little bit. Uh, add a little bit of hair on it, a uh, little bit of girth inside the, you know, the, the mix, because they're just, this is just oh, a Logic yeah. EXS. Oh yeah, right here, saturation. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's it. One. And that's all, that's all that's happening right there. Cool. And then, out, like I said, outside here, you get a little bit of EQ on the board. I'm pulling some, what's the low-mid channel, but it's really definitely in the getting close to the high-mids area. And a little bit of high-mid just around the guitar. That is, a, the main signal's a little on the low side. Can you, are you on the GoPro? We lose the GoPro yep. again? This thing. I turned the auto off, off. <laughs> and it's plugged in. Yeah. Oh. I hate GoPros. So you're going to have to, you know, you can't see it because I don't have that shot anymore. But I, I have aux 7 and 8 here is sending to the, the TCM 3000 over here. And it's pre'd out. So I'm using a bit more of the reverb channel over the direct. Again, to kind of move it back where the drums are a little bit and get behind the guitar just to get a little bit of separation from it. And that... is, wait, what happened here? There, where'd we go? Get that buddy back on. Let's get it on. I'm not gonna sing, don't worry, people. Let's turn these guys on. <laughs> Will be the remix. We got more cowbell and jingle bells. And that's that's our rhythm section stuff. Pretty see have I forgotten anything? I don't think so. No. I think I got everything. Yeah, so that th there's where we ended up sonically with all of that. So now let's get to Hacksaw because he rules. Worked with this guy for a long time. A lot of fun to work with him, and he sounds fantastic. Let's go here to uh, verse one. Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell rock. Jingle bells swing and jingle bells ring. Snowing and blowing up bushels of fun. Now the jingle hop has begun. Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell rock. Jingle bells chime in jingle bell time. Dancing and prancing in jingle bell square. In the frosty air. I'm gonna apologize now to everyone. This is gonna be stuck in your head. Is this gonna be like that Mariah Carey Christmas song that none of us wanna hear anymore, but every year we sing the damn thing because it's everywhere. Although if I had the ability to write a song like that, I would do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> so Brian, if, if I, let's see, we had two mics. So this is what we were doing back then. And the only reason I remember this is because I actually do have a, <laughs> A note on this. We're using a an MXL V87 and a V89 together. It's not double. It's we recorded them at the same time. I don't remember doing this, but that's exactly what is in here. Most likely, we had them set up probably right on top of each other. Yeah. Brian has a very full voice. Uh, a little bit of rasp in there that's cool. Also, ridiculously good at controlling controlling his own volume. I mean, he's, oh yeah, like you don't even really need to do a lot of control compression or anything like that so you can do things either for color or for you know some sort of taste or preference he's just he can manipulate a microphone like no one i've ever seen he's really really good at it so he's easy to record so we have two channels and i didn't get a screenshot of that so sorry but it's just two of the same channel two different microphones that is coming out to one channel here on the board which is the brian lead channel I am giving him, I am pulling a little bit of low mid, probably down in the, it's not labeled on here, the 250, 300 area, because Brian has a thick voice. His signal flow is Cush Clairphonic. 
which I don't know where I ended up over here. Yeah, can you go to camera five? Five. Here we go. And we lost six. So Clairphonic, then it's going into the IGS tube core, and then it finally goes all the way over to the other side, which that camera's down for some reason, into the Day King. The tube core I have set a little fast, fast release for sure, and a little bit fast attack, only doing a few dB of, of reduction. One thing I like about that is it's a little bit of a brighter compressor, but it also has this, you know, being the very mu, it has this way of just kind of rounding things off in a cool way, which I liked. And then the Day King is set, what am I set? It's it's more of a limiter setting, but it's a slow attack. I have it on auto release because I think the auto release on the Day King does a fantastic job. I don't often change that. I think the compressor is smarter than me, so I let it do its thing. And it's and and that's it. Then he's getting a little bit of that delay that you heard is the the big E slapback. Here, can you go over to camera one? I'll, uh, camera one, here we go. Get this thing down. This is the effects rack. So it's going right here to this guy. And that's where that bit of delay is, co is coming from. All right, come back over to seven. Excellent, I'm gonna put this guy back up. I'm also the camera op today. Which, <laughs> judging by how good a job I've done keeping cameras on, I probably should lose my gig. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna try one more time. Oh, I heard it. Maybe we'll get. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Yeah, somebody was saying that they probably heat up and then shut down. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, why the other one? Okay, we need a. Yeah. We'll flip it. But I'll do that while I'm talking. Uh, connects. So, so that is that, and that's all that's going on in Brian. There's no other effects. We kind of liked the playfulness of the whole thing, and we left it there. So th that's Brian. He kicks ass. Next, let's go. Let's see. Oh, I see. So we have some background vocals from Aubrey and Nicole who are freaking, they're great and a ton of fun to work with. I mean, even though I think it was probably like August or something we were doing these songs, we were having a blast doing them. So here are just some of the backgrounds. Let me pull Brian into. Bride time, it's the right time to rock the night away. Jingle bell time is a swell time to go gliding in a one. And here's the outro is kind of cool. That's a jingle bell. That's a jingle bell. That's a jingle bell rock. Yeah. Jazz hands. I like the way they finished that. That's not automation. That is them doing all of that. And they're getting a little bit of outboard compression. Oh, actually, get that sucker on. Too many things to turn off. Okay, let me get let me flip this GoPro setting so I can show you some console stuff and you're not looking at it upside down. <laughs> uh, 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 rotation. There you go. There we are. Okay, cool. So we have so we are we are back to that. Of course, I don't have anything to show at this moment there, but we'll get, we'll get back to it. So. That's a jingle bell. That's a jingle bell. That's a jingle bell. Rock. Yeah. There we go. Helps when you get that compressor on. So here's a verse. Giddy up, jingle horse, pick up your feet. Jingle around the clock. Mix and mingle and jingle and feel. That's the jingle bell. Now that we did do some automation on as a tool to get from that last verse into the jazz section before the outro. Let me turn everybody back on. So we drums are getting some automation and spots, the organ, guitars, and I think we did it on the, the girls too, just to to make our transition to the jazz happen. Mix and mingle and jingle and feel. That's the jingle bell. 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 So 
we did use the automation as a tool to kind of create the feel of it drop, literally kind of dropping off yeah. into that jazz section. Because the, like, the fades that were there originally, the way we played it, were cool, but eh, a little boring. And that is... Any questions? Complaints? Uh, you no. Know, if there's complaints, I got an email address everybody can use. No. <laughs> it's not my email, though. So the person you're going to email is not going to be very happy. But it'd be kind of funny. Yeah, so 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 David was asking about the the sum, you know, from the vocals. It was just uh, was it two different tracks or or or? Yeah, that that's right. I need to cover that. So it's we did what did we do? So we have a left and right of everything that's doubled, but we had them singing. If I to, correct me if I'm wrong, we had them singing together, same mic, right? We didn't split. We did it all. Um, I no. When when I looked at the background vocals, they were actually singing separate. No, but we have we doubled everything. Oh yeah, yeah. But but I. But but the left and the right is Aubrey on one side, and then Nicole okay, was so, on the other. Because yeah. I, it was White Christ It was the first one we did. Yeah, that, exactly. Yeah, this is yeah. not the first tune we recorded. That yeah. was White Christmas. So, yeah. So it's it's one on each side. And then I'm getting a little bit of compression out here with a, another revive modded piece of gear. You guys, if you have some gear that you can get modded by Revive. I'm gonna see if I can speak English. If you have some gear that you wanna get modded by Revive that they do, I highly recommend it. They kick ass. Uh, and they're not sponsoring this video. I just, they do great work. So that's going through a Pro VLA that's modded. And then on top of that, and this I probably should've got a screenshot of too, I'm adding, I'm sending on a, on a bus in Logic, I'm sending the vocals to a stereo delay that's short. What am I? 30 on the left, 60 on the right, and then I'm detuning slightly, about four cents on the left, minus four, plus four on the right, and I'm blending that back in. That comes out up here. The, here, can you flip over? We got GoPro. Good. Yeah. Go to GoPro real quick. There you go. So this section up here is where obviously all the effects are returning. But I always have this seven. This is my in-the-box effects return. So if I have anything going there, it comes back up here. And that's where I'm sending what's coming from the computer now with the, the detuned vocal that's just blended in. And I really just wanted a kind of chorus thing to make it kind of like almost feel like it's moving. So as they move a little bit in there, you feel it underneath and it gives a bit of a, a kind of a chorusy shifty effect that just blends in nicely in context. Solo, you obviously, when we were soloing it, you can freaking hear it, you know, but I think it sounds cool, so I left it in there. And that, hopefully, did that answer the question? Um, yeah, I mean, and no, because he asked um, uh, about Brian. He used two mics that were summed into one oh, track. Oh, that. No, no, no. There's no, they were on two different tracks because oh, we yeah. have them on two different tracks here. Okay. Now, I would be doing one mic most likely going to two channels unsummed also so I can and flip them. But these were, this was two mics, two channels. I don't even think, if we had the uh, Alan Heath we could have summed, but I don't, even, I don't know if we had that then. I, there are no records from this period. Yeah. It's ancient history. <laughs> we could go back and dig the site up. That studio's gone, actually. It got shut down about two years ago, or right before the pandemic, because uh, somebody reported it for asbestos. <laughs> oh, JS says, says, every time you guys go live, my life instantly gets better. <laughs> awesome. He says, please don't die anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't plan on it. <laughs> oh, that's Although great. I may have a heart attack with how many things are going on right now. <laughs> My anxiety is a little on the high side. <laughs> but that is, so the Brian is not summed. They're two separate tracks. Then I'm summing it to one track on the board. So what we did is we went in there and we depict, hey, we like this combination of, you know, this much of this mic and this much of the other mic, whatever it was. That comes out to one channel, and then it gets treated as one mic. So it is getting summed. It just didn't get summed during tracking. Now I'm a little bit braver. I'll sum stuff yeah. during tracking. All right, you want to quick, uh, quickly address in, a, in an overview the hybrid setup? Yes. Okay. Quickly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, as, you as best. you know who I am? Yeah. We got was... power? We got power? Um, yeah, it, uh, here you're still fine. Okay, but good. But over there, it's, it's good. Good. So, okay, so this is... <sighs> Where do I start? This is moving around a, a lot right now. The last week, a lot uh, of additions have happened. You've seen one of them. 
I did a short video or a short a while back on the MIDI timepiece, and I'll see if I can get this camera down to that in a second. So, so this is a bit shifting. I'm in the middle of experiment mode, which is making it a little bit uh, hard to get in creative mode for the mixing, which was nice that we got to work together on this yesterday, so I could spend some time just dealing with tech crap, and I could turn the, the, some things over to him. But the way it's set up is everything in Logic comes out, I, I divide it up into channels out here on the board. So let's take the drums, for instance. I take whatever I have for kicks. That comes out to channel one. Whatever I have for snares, channel two. Overheads, three, four. Toms, five, six. Uh, in this case, there's three toms, but I'm going to a stereo track, and I do that all the time. So I, I'll do, I'll leave my blend and my panning happens inside the box and it shows up on a stereo track out here on the board and I just pan it hard left and hard right. That has some sort of processing usually, not all, not all the time, but usually quite often it is the Tonelux TX5C. And in this case, we added the sound sculptors. Then the bass will come out, even if I have a DI and then it's some mics on there, I will find a blend that I like. It'll come out on the track. Then I will do my parallel bass I'll, I'll copy everything and it will come out parallel. I used to run it off an aux, but now I just copy it and send it out a second track in here so I can have full control over it. And uh, most of the time my auxes are tied up with other things, so it just it opened up some workflow. Yeah. And then physical inputs and outputs, you need what? Yeah, okay, good question. Yeah. So the physical and outputs, we're running 32 channels is what I normally have here. So I have 32 channels of, log of IO in the Motus that are in, everything's in the patch bay. But my, if I set output one in Logic, it goes through the patch bay, half normal down through one, shows up on channel one. I have a total of 56 ins and outs available to me. 32 go directly to the faders, another 32 go directly to my monitor returns. So if I need more than 32 channels, I can patch into stereo groups in my monitor returns. They only feed the master though. Keep me on track here, because yeah. there's a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a lot here. So I have more out. Well, not, I could use more outs. But right now, I have enough to run 32 and 32. So actually, I have 64 total. Yeah, we do, because we have four, yeah. four Motus down there. That That's the in, in and out. So going in, one to one, coming out, one to one, in, two to two, out, two to two. That's set up over there in the patch base, so I never have to patch, ever. It's just easy. If I'm patching, it's because I want to put something in or send it somewhere else. But if I'm just simply going, I need to get my bass guitar out to the console, I know channel 13 and, and 14 are always going to be my bass. That's where I always put them. I set it out in Logic to 13, it comes out here to the board, and now I can interface with anything going out here. Obviously, you can still use plugins if necessary, and that does happen quite often. Today, it's not happening very much at all. But that gets everything out here in out and outboard land, in analog land, to have a little bit of fun with things. Yeah. And here's a be beginner's question. So if you want to have 64 things you want to listen to, right, that you theoretically have on the board, mm -hmm. do you need 64 outputs in hardware? No. Okay. Not technically. Yeah. So yeah. So so that's a good thing. So I I like to have everything split so it's right here in front of me as much as possible. But there are you know there's more background vocals than I have channels here, right? So for instance, on Aubrey and Nicole, I have a stereo sum where I have everything in there. I decide the levels. I even have the panning of them set up there. You can do automation if you need to level things or bring something out over another or change it however you like. That feeds two tracks, and I think total back in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. We have fourteen tracks throughout the song, not at all the time. At any given time, there's maybe four happening, but that's all coming out to stereo. So if you had, let's say you were working on a, oh, somebody's up, on a, a, a claret or something that only had two outs, you could actually. Well, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I was going to have an analogy. Hi, girl. Say hi. Say hi to everybody. Can... <laughs> <laughs> but you, I, do, I can send things to stereo groups. So if I have more, 
I could have 150 tracks here and I would just pick stereo groups. And that's quite often where I end up using uh, the, the monitor returns is I'll set it and I'll just turn them wide open and they're literally just extra outputs to get something out here, out to the, to the analog world. And then I can feed it to the stereo, which then feeds the mix bus. I'm not sure I answered that question very well. Uh, ask it again if I didn't. Yeah. Uh, well, we're using, because they're asking about the interface, we're using the old 24 IOs. So that's basically 24 ins and outs. There's so, two of those. Yeah. So that's basically 48 uh, through, um, yeah, PCI. And then you have a 2408. There's, there's two 2408s. Yeah. So there's another 16 analog there, yeah. plus all the digital ins and outs. Yeah. So we could go add an optical if we want it through the 2408s. Yeah, but they're the, the analog yeah. inputs, yeah. there's eight on each. Mm -hmm. So those are all hooked up. Hence, how do we get to our 64 yeah. channels right there? Now, some of the, th those two are in the patch bay. Our headphone system feeds that directly. So if we're doing a session, I don't have to patch any headphones in. I just usually open up aux. <laughs> Somebody wants attention. I just open up some aux channels. I send to the whatever sound, like say kick drum, I send an aux, you know, one for my drums. I set that to output 33 and 34. That automatically goes to the headphone system in the other room. But it's all in the patch base. So if I need those channels when mixing, all I have to do is patch them in somewhere which I'm not doing now. We're only using the faders and the effects returns right now. That's all that's going on here, which is what I try to do. I try to pare things down. You know, the same thing with the percussion. There's like six or seven tracks of percussion and it's all coming out just a stereo group. So I'm doing all the automation in the box and, uh, and panning. And it comes out here where I have a little bit of final automation if needed. And then I have it sending to an outboard reverb yeah. just to blend with everything else. And if you can't, uh, you try to do as much as you can, like EQ-wise, on, on the board and not so much in the box, right? Preferably, yeah. because I got a lot of fun-sounding EQs, I think. What I usually start with EQ-wise, and there's no rule to this, by the way, but this is just where it starts. Most of my EQ in the box will be fixing, like tight notches, just get, you know, some, something resonating in some drums or any sound, sound source, actually. We did a little bit to Brian on this. And it's fixing. Although I do have a few plug, I use the 9066 Trident plugin a lot. That thing sounds great, so I will add more if I if I need it that way. But I try to get out to the board because I like a lot of this for a lot of the drums, especially. Uh, I like this EQ a lot on bass. I tend to gravitate towards the 8803 for guitars or the Tone Lux EQ 5Ps on guitars, also good. The vocals most of the time are the Clairphonic, because that thing is just like some kind of voodoo that's really cool. And then I'll do a little bit more here on the Trident if needed. But not afraid to use plugins. Not, you know, just, it, we aren't using much here except for notching. It's all clean up. But I try to do the heavy lifting on any boosting out here, although there's some cuts on it too. Does that answer that question? I mean, yeah, pretty much because they were asking, so you pre-mix pre in, the, in the box. It's Very little. Yeah. Very Almost little. like preparing the tracks in the, in the in the box, right? Yeah. Yeah, and actually, once once I get this to where I can get this screen hooked up, this would be easier to show you what's going on. So I'll try to explain it with this setup with the automation going. I have 32 at the beginning of the session. I have 32 aux channels set up to no output. Those channels correspond with their number out here. Channel one, channel one, two, two, three, three, and so on. On those, I have a, a send, an aux send that goes to the output. So for instance, at the very beginning of my session, I have aux one, no output. On that aux on that bus, I have an aux send there going to output one, set to pre-fader. So that allows me to have this fader over here move up and down, not affect my audio that's coming out of there because it's set pre-fader. So the aux is still sending it or the bus send I have on that aux is still sending out to one here. But the aux itself is only controlling that fader. So that's where I write all of this automation. At least this is how I'm exploring this right now. That allows me to have all of my fader movements here post any outboard movement here. There is a lot of automation going on inside the box on the other channels. So I have one through 32 at the top of the session. 
Then I have my channels that are outboard MIDI connections. That I do have a screenshot of. There should be one that has the TC and the, the what's the thing called? MIDI, uh, quadriverb. So there's, oh yeah, we'll get to that in a second. So go, keep going, keep going, keep going, one more. Did I forget it? No, uh, yeah. I did, I forgot it, never mind. It looks just like a normal channel. But after one through 32, those are my channels that control the MIDI timepiece. Those are after this, because I have the, I have logic set to not follow selection. So these faders, no matter where I go in my set, I could have 5,000 channels. I could go all the way to 5,000. These channels are always gonna be stuck at 132. So I can go make other changes to the actual tracks that have the audio on them while this is all going so I can hear what's happening with all my outboard processing without any of these faders moving. And we did a lot of blending so yes, there is some pre-mixing going on, especially on the channels that are just stereo. So yeah, I guess in that case, those yeah. channels are pre-mixed uh -huh. in the box. Drums, no, except for the, uh, the toms are getting are pre-panned and kind of pre-leveled. And then I move them as a group. Yeah, let me show you camera four. There you go. Okay, yeah, so the top, like for instance, the toms, all three channels are coming out too. They're in the box, they are pre uh, panned and kind of pre leveled. They come out here. Now I move them as a group as I want to. And then I have a little bit of extra EQ as a group. And then the, the compression, and in this case, the, the sound sculptures as well on the, on the group to kind of, kind of glue them. And then they go to the drum group. That's the same thing happening over here with the girls. It is pre-mixed in the box, comes out to two channels, and that's any final movements right there. Anything that is single sources or stuff that I might want to move a lot, I do out here. Or in this case, I know, say on a kick and snare, I know on the kick, I love the, the SSL EQ, or sorry, compressor. Same, I like it on the snare too, I'm not using it today, but I know I have certain pieces of gear that I like better than anything I have in the box. Mainly because I probably know it good, and so I know what it's going to happen so I can get there quicker. So that stuff I leave on single channels so I can deal with that out here. And then it gets grouped outside the box together. Where am I at now? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that, was, that was the la uh, latest Have question. I missed it. I need, w I'm gonna figure out a way to get this old 2009 talking to the switch and I will do a, a breakdown with visuals that'll make it a lot easier to see. But I guess the, the basics of it is all of these channels, I have an identical setup at the very top of my logic session. And then after that, the next thing in line is all the control with the MIDI, MIDI timepiece. So I can actually automate every piece of outboard effects over here. Some more than others. The TC stuff, the newer stuff, you can automate everything. It's crazy. Same with the quad reverb, actually, too. Some of the others, the SPX90 program changes only. The MIDI verb program changes only, which I, I rarely do there because it's like, it's kind of set it and forget it. The Pro R3, the Yamaha, I've only done program changes uh, and that's it. But the, uh, the TC stuff and the Quad River, I can actually mute. I can turn things on and off. It, it's, it's basically like a plug-in. It's great. So I can use the stuff I like. And then that stuff all comes up up here, except for the Quad Reverbs. They're coming up down here on 31 and 32. The reason for that is they're freaking noisy. <laughs> so you notice the automation is down. It comes up for the effect on the guitar solo. And then when the guitar solo is over, it goes back down and we, we lose that noise, which is great. And he actually had fun yesterday because it was his first time getting to control the program changes from in the box. You, you know, the external yeah. MIDI has a program change and you just turn the dial up and down the number and it corresponds with what's going on out here. So I would just sit down there and make sure everything was working right. And he's literally just, oh, good, next program, next program here, next program here, until he found something he dug. So that was actually, yeah. that was I, cool. I was flipping through presets using uh, MIDI messages. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I still had to use a mouse, but it was. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. the cool thing about that is when we open the session back up and I turn those on, as soon as the SPL moves and it hits one of the nodes for that setting, it jumps those pieces of gear right to that setting or whatever we had saved with it. And you're, boom, you're off and running. And some of the gear you can do on the fly changes and turn things off, which is really cool. So it's basically like outboard plugins and it's sounds that I like. I love quad reverbs, you know, 
I love the MidiVerb. You know, they're just they're just fun, cool sounding pieces of gear. So that just made it so I could control them, and it helps a little bit with recall. And so far, everything seems to be working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, 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 pretty deep, pretty complex. Yeah. You know? So everything that's being controlled. Here's the overall setup. And if I know I missed, I probably did not answer the the the, the question quite enough on the hybrid part of it. Uh, so if I missed something, please ask again, and I'll try to answer it better. As far as the hybrid thing goes, I'm not doing any I/O plugins that way. So all of my analog, anything happens out here in the analog realm. Anything, uh, background vocals, toms, uh, percussion, the things that have more channels than I have here, or more channels than I want to give up, that gets kind of pre-mixed, pre panned in the box, and comes out on a stereo channel for further processing if wanted or not. It just feeds the, the mix chain. That's the first connection with this computer. Well, technically it's the one, two, three, four, <laughs> fifth. But so with Ethernet, I am synced to the, the print computer, which you can't, we don't even have anywhere in a shot. No. But it is, I did a video on this earlier on when all the racks went in, check that out. It sits over here, it is hooked up with Ethernet. The Apogee Rosetta 200 is directly hooked to that. So the master channel here, there, I don't use the insert on this channel. I use inserts everywhere else. Drum bus, parallel compression, all that is on the inserts. Here, all these red buttons. Here, flip real quick to, to four. Sure. We'll just do that real fast. All these red buttons up here are channel inserts. I have the still, I'm working with mostly prototype gear here, so the the buses don't have an insert. All the production models actually have inserts as well that you can turn on and off. But I am using all these inserts, but not the master channel. It's not even hooked up. All right, flip back over. Mm -hmm. It's not even hooked up. So this blue fader right here simply pushes directly to the C1. Can you go over to Number one camera Uno? That goes directly to the C1. This is all hardwired. So C1 feeds the 542s, which this is only the second mix I've swapped them. And so far I'm digging it. And then the, the 542s feed the ultraviolet. I am going to experiment with something here, but not for a little while because I got too much going on. The cool thing about this right now is I can really push into it. And I actually have a final trim right here that I can and do use if necessary. Right now I'm not. I like where everything's sitting. The output of this goes back over to, well, we don't have a shot of that, so just come back to seven. That, this all happens in the patch bay, by the way. This output in the patch bay goes right down to C1. All of that stuff is hardwired, comes out of the end of that, directly into the analog section of the Rosetta, which is down here in front of Ernesto by his feet. That Rosetta is hooked directly to that computer, so the whole print chain is over there. Still love the sound of those old Rosettas, man. I think yeah, yeah. Too, just fucking, they sound great. So I have an Ethernet connection between this computer, this 2009 Fantastico, and that 2012 laptop, going yeah. back in time. I am sending MIDI time code from Logic to that computer, so the laptop is slaved to the main machine. So when I'm bouncing anything, especially when I'm printing stems, it's all lined up. So that computer I just put in record, I hit R, as soon as I hit play on this main machine, the print machine starts and it's printing. And that way when I do stims, everything is lined up. Even if I have revisions and mixes, we can go. I can solo things up. I compare it to a previous revision, see if I like it, dislike it, whatever. All of that comes back automatically on the two track right here on the console. The output of the Apogee in the patch bay is directly hooked to the two track button. The cool thing with this is if I wanna hear what's going on, all I have to do is turn the two track on and I'm listening to that. When we're tracking, I can turn the Apogee into all analog mode, which analog in, analog out. I can then listen to when we're tracking through the two bus processing, which is fun. <laughs> A lot of times it just sounds better. So that is, I can use it tracking and obviously in mixing, that's what we want to hear. So this way I'm listening to the very, very end of the process. So I hear everything that's happening and that's what we're monitoring. Yeah, here's a cool question. How often do you reach for RX when preparing tracks? And do you have to clear noise or do you bother rotating phase? Phase, I don't, oh, that's a deep question. Well, I'll reach to RX. That to me is one of the coolest plugins. That, it's like special voodoo. 
If I need to clean something up, I will. But I don't do it as an automatic. I don't know. Do you either? No. I mean, it depends on the project. There's a huge project coming up that I can't yeah. say anything about that I spent more time in RX than I did actually recording it. Uh, for but, reasons I I'll Yeah, say later. but try it first without it. Yeah. yeah. But if there is if there is some hiss on something, I, absolutely, I'll go there. It's great for getting a hum out. Um, it's just It just works really, really well. So it is there, and I'll use it when absolutely necessary. I don't do a lot of phase alignment type stuff. I'm trying to think how to phrase this right. I, for me, RX is purely cleanup. Hums, hiss, uh, I've wrote noises. If you, especially if you have a nice, I did something for Debbie. And we had a, there was a click from the guitar player, the, the acoustic guy. And I thought it was cool because it just made it feel very real, but she's like, it's too much. So I had to go in and find where he was tapping his foot and RX that out. <laughs> that to me is some crazy voodoo and it was cool. So that type of stuff it's fantastic for, uh, and I will not hesitate to use it if needed. But a lot of times inside a mix like this, especially if it's rock, this isn't a clean popish kind of thing or whatever where everything needs to be ridiculously pristine, right? And almost free of blemishes. I like blemishes. So I won't do it unless I absolutely have to. Or if maybe, you know, you have a vocal that wasn't recorded well and it gets to a break where it's only the vocal featured and all of a sudden you hear some of that, yeah, I'll go in and and fix that stuff. I don't do a lot of phase aligning, if that was your question about that. Uh, and then to finish the setup, they say, how do you get your tracks back into Logic? Are you printing grouped stems or the individual tracks? Okay, that, that's part of what, the, what I just went over with the hookup of the Apogee and why I have this machine slaved to that machine. I don't, at least at this point in time, I am not printing all my individuals with whatever processing back in because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me, that with, at least with the setup that I have, because my final, all my final sounds come through some sort of bus out here. So if I take that off and just send these individuals in, it's completely whack. Because not only are these buses happening, but then it's going over here to that final master bus. So there's a lot of things happening that it just kind of gets pared down. So that print machine over here, this is why I have it synced with MIDI time code, so I can hit play on this, the machine here, and that's recording everything in time. So at the end of a, a mix, I'll print a fair amount of stems, but most of them end up being stereo groups of stuff. You know, all the drums, bass, guitar will be a stem, guitar solo will be its own stem. Uh, maybe in this case, I'll probably have the jazz guitar be its own stem. Brian, the lead vocal, I would print dry, and then I would print the effects as a separate stem. And that all happens on that machine. So I ended up with the second session that has all my stems. Then if I want, if I have to do a stem mix, I just pull that session over to this computer and I'm going. I almost never pull all my stems back in the main session. That just stays its own thing. And I have a stem session with everything. And for me, it just keeps it cleaner. For a while, I printed back into here and it, the session's kind of, <laughs> yeah. it's like the ancient scrolls, man. It drove me insane. Yeah. And you committing more, which is the whole point. Right. And that is important. That yeah. is a very, very important fact, this whole thing. It makes you make a freaking decision and go. Yeah. So I do print stems, but it's all happening on that other computer, which is why they're slaved together and synced perfectly together. So that is the main first connection. That's happening via Ethernet. On top of that, I am controlling that computer with screen sharing, also on that same Ethernet connection. Yeah. So on this screen, well, here, let me see. Here, I'll do this. Uh oh I'm going to try to do this and refocus so you, you can see. This will make a little more sense. Focus. Okay. So flip over to, to one. To one. Okay. So there's, there's the screen, right? This is the logic session that we've been listening to. But here I have a second window. This is the laptop that you can now see that's over here. That way I don't have to get up and go over to it. I can do... Well, right now I keep core audio open because it's being a pain in the ass. But I think I know why it, it, it was. Because uh, I think if it's not hooked up to power, it will lose the FireWire connection. But it was hooked up to power? To... No, no, it wasn't. Nope. Oh, yeah. Well, we might figure that out. Excellent. Yeah. So that, now what I would do in here is I'd have some mixes. These were stuff we were printing yesterday just to, to listen. And I'd usually have two like this. There'll be 
the first mix here, I know this is really hard to see guys, I apologize, but this first channel right here, I would have my regular mix and I have one right below it that's my instrumental mix. And then if I had TV versions or other versions, it would happen below that. Once the mix is finalized and I ha we have something that we like, I would create as many tracks now that I need to bounce the stems from the board. Drums would get a stereo. Bass would get most likely a stereo unless I have effects, which is rare, but sometimes uh, we go to the, you can go back to seven now. And that all happens in that session. So I do print back in, but just not individuals. Man, I, I was watching something with, uh, what was it? Uh, Shippen, every Shippen, and the way he does it is, oh my lord, insanely complicated, but cool. I'm not quite, I don't quite want to get that complicated, at least yet. So there's that connection. So that's two connections going to and from that computer over there. Then I have this guy connected, controlling everything, which unfortunately I knocked off of here the other day, it fell flat on its face, parts fell off. It hasn't been the same ever since. I will probably have to buy another one, unfortunately, but that is connected. Then there's the automation that is connected. It's IP over MIDI, so it's running Huey protocol, so we're connected that way. And then on top of that, I have the MIDI timepiece, which is coming in via USB connection. That Can you show that real quick? Which one? The MIDI timepiece. Oh. This? Yeah, that's the one. So flip so over to that's camera three. three. So this is the setup for all of the outboard effects. And you can see there's the, the MIDI timepiece is the big guy at the top, and then this it's guy. channel one through eight going from left to right. And that is one, the two, order three. of everything. And that's how it shows up in Logic. So when I create, I will do a video on this when you can see it. I gotta figure out how to get this screen yeah. to, to hook up. Well, I'll, I'll do a, here, flip back to seven real quick. I'll do an on-demand video to where I can film it and I can take screen capture of, of the whole thing and not have to worry about so many connections going uh, crazy because I'm a little on nerve right now. So far it's all working. Uh, but when I select any of those pieces of outboard gear in Logic, I create a track just like I would create an audio track except instead of selecting audio, I select external MIDI. The external MIDI now reads the, all that set up in audio MIDI. So I see... Uh, in order, TCM3000, TCD2, Yamaha Pro R3, SPX90, M350, MIDI Verb, then both of the quad verbs. It shows up, and I select that. Now I have control over all of that stuff, or at least a fair amount of the parameters. And in Logic, it's just another, it's just, it just looks like an audio track, but it's only, it, it's only controlling external MIDI. It has no MIDI information directly on it. It is not that kind of the MIDI, external MIDI. And that is all the connections that are going to this yeah. computer right now. So one with the X-Touch, two with the MIDI time code there, three with the screen sharing, four with the automation, and a fifth connection down there with the MIDI, the, the MIDI time piece. So it's still pretty amazing that all this MIDI stuff is still working, you know, because when you think about it, think are going left and right, yeah. and, and you still are working. So it's not like, oh, it's a total mess. I press one button and everything goes to hell, you know, so... Yeah, there, there's a few of yeah. that we're still working some of all the connection out. So there's, I have a couple workarounds at the moment because this is, this setup as you see it, you're the first group, big group of people to see it. And I did my first mix with this on, what's today, Sunday? We mixed Key of F on Wednesday, Thursday, whatever day that yeah, was, Tuesday Thursday or Wednesday. Probably, yeah, whatever. That was the first mix that was done with all of this stuff running. You know, the automation only went in five days before that. You know, so I'm literally figuring all this out as we're going. So it's like I'm half in tech brain, half in creative brain. And that's, uh, that isn't fun when you're mixing because you can't really, I'm, I'm, I'm being more tech sometimes than creative. But it's starting to make a little sense. And I have, there's more than one way to hook all this up. So I'm kind of going through those ways. And then I'm going to go do the same thing in Pro Tools. And I'm going to test it out a little bit with Studio One as well just to see what's happening. But right now, so far, and Logic itself is sending everything where it needs to go pretty well. Yeah, I mean, Jesus, uh, it's it's pretty complicated. I mean, it's all those MIDI messages everywhere, and then uh, yeah. uh, stop, 
play, stop, play, and then you see faders move, and this is yeah. like, oh man, this is still communicating. And you know? you'll <laughs> see stuff go on and off over here to the left on all the the outboard hard <laughs> hardware. Yeah, and all so that. it's uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's a bit. And on, I mean, on top of that, I mean, that's a huge workflow change, you know, that I'm now trying to get to get used to, and at the same time, you know, trying to see where there might be issues so we can try to fix some stuff out here. And then on top of that, we have a whole rack of new stuff. Ernesto's brought his Rupert Neve stuff over to use for a while, which is the 535, what do we got here? So let the me, 535. Uh, do we have that one? Yeah, camera oh, five. So, yeah, five. Here we go. The 535s and the 551s, and then new just in now, the Trident High Lows. I am... I've been wanting to try these for a while, so I am super stoked. And then a pair of ADB EQs here. And then all the master bus stuff that was here went over to my left on the other side. So there's a lot of gear coming in. You can flip back over to seven. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of new gear to try to figure out what's going on. At the same time, this whole giant workflow changed. So when I have it a little bit more sussed out, I will go back to these comments to make sure I get a video that kind of really walks through it where I can diagram everything out where you can see the screen and all the stuff that's necessary. Oh yeah, the other thing is I put a pair of my old Comp 54s back in over here to the left. Because they sound killer on drums and I like the other pair on guitar, so. Questions? Oh yeah, okay. here it says, uh, um, uh, Alma Artistica Studio, he's from Brazil. He said, I met you when you did a recording session with a cassette T tape task cam. I thought it was great. So uh, I started at the time with a with an ADAT from Elysis and I already had a cassette task cam. So yeah, I mean, we went through all kinds of uh, experiments. Little ADATs, <laughs> man. I hope I never have to work on an ADAT again. Yeah. DA88 was better, but yeah. it was so, better yeah, to I mean, Elysis. Stuff you try, but man, with cassettes, the, the, the hiss, oh, if that part is pretty bad, it's like, uh, it's... Uh, well, yeah, go yeah. check out the, the second songs from the studio yeah. episodes. It was all done on the fourth yeah, time. Uh, you just got to learn to embrace the hiss. And we we tried to RX some of that, but you get to a certain point where you, you just can't any further yeah, yeah. before it messes with things too much. And, and that was also really yeah. early on in my RXing. Yeah. You know, so I pretty sure I messed some and, of that. And up RX so. sometimes, depending if you want to remove clicks or hiss, will take also of that really high end away, so uh, some of the clarity also will, will, will go. Right, yeah. and on a tape machine that's only going to 12K, <laughs> we need it all the high end we could get. So, we yeah. are, right now, it's behind us somewhere, the eight track. We still have yet to get back to that and do some stuff with, with that, but we had to move that now because we have our monitor so we can see all our cameras over here to the left. So, did I miss anything? Guys, I know that was a bit of a roundabout explanation of all this. I will do a detailed explanation of that with the video where I can actually take you know, screenshots of everything that needs to happen to to set it up. But I'm kind of in the middle of a huge change here still, so I'm wrapping my head around it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess the, the, the whole separate printing setup is is fairly common. Some some big makers uh, are using that, right? It's, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Who, who from the big guys? Um, or they at least print through another set yeah. of, of stuff. I don't know. Joe Barisi does. I know Barisi right? has it. I don't yeah. know if he prints back into his session with the other. Whatever I think he's he prints through. separate. You know, a few. There's there's a handful guys, and yeah. I know I've seen Vance print back into his session and do his through his tape machine yeah. and do all sorts of stuff. The thing I like about that is it opens me up to work here, and I never have to worry about turning any of that yeah. mix bus stuff on or off. And I all I have to do. Let's say we we're in the middle of this, and Ernesto's like, "Dude, I hate my solo," and he's gonna force me to re-record it. Okay, all I do is I turn the two-track off. I can enable anything in Logic for to record now. I'm just not going through the Apogee, so we don't have that latency because it's old Firewire. We're just listening to directly off the stereo output pre-mix bus. We go record whatever. I don't have to change a thing in this session. Then I go, "Okay, you got it, great." And now I'm mixing again. That's uh, it, it's it. I, and I don't, I can keep my, my latency. I have, I think I'm set at, what do we set right now? 64. My buffer size is 64 samples, which is where I keep this machine at. Especially this old session is at 96. For some reason in 2007, 2008, <laughs> we thought it was important to record our half-assed drum tones and stuff. So, so how much late latency does Logic report there? 
We are two and a half milliseconds round trip coming in and out of the Motus. I mean, that's that's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, and that that the higher the sample rate, the lower the latency. Yeah. But even at 48, it's uh, yeah. Four I mean, seconds. I think this thing is seconds. always my uh, below five milliseconds. Yeah. Yeah. Which is which is ideal because there's a lot of USB stuff that is above five milliseconds. And once you get to 10 milliseconds, any drummer will hear it on his hi-hat. Well, singers will hear it probably first yeah. than anything because they'll hear their vo voice start to phase. Yeah. And there are some gear that if you're doing one channel at a time or maybe two, it's fine. But if once you start doing more, yeah. then you have a problem, you know. Yeah. So you just have to make sure whatever your needs are to buy the, the stuff that works yeah. best for That's you. That's why I'm portable nowadays, it has to be Thunderbolt. You know, I mean. Well, that's gonna happen next year. Yeah. So I mean, I'm I'm really curious if anybody says that USB is enough. It's like, well, what about 30 channels at the same time with headphone mixes? What about that? Well, I think it comes down to if you yeah. are they're building custom drivers. Exactly. If they're, if they're using exactly. the, the generic drivers, uh, no. But if they're building the custom, because I know the Antelope yeah. stuff works pretty well. Yep. And uh, I'm sure there's. So, I mean, there's I'm, enough bandwidth in USB apparently, theoretically. But it's all about the driver. Yeah. Yep. Yep. They make good drivers. You're probably going to have uh, good working gear. If they don't, you probably won't. It'll come down to that. That is. What have we not covered? Uh, I'm a little less uh, anxious now that we've kind of gotten through and got to listen to things. Everything has actually worked. There is no <laughs> no better way of doing things than going, oh, it's their third day using this ridiculously com complicated <laughs> setup that you don't really know what to do if something goes wrong. Let's do a live stream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Sean is saying that, that uh, RME uh, does the, the good stuff over USB, and I know because they, uh, they make good stuff. They, they write great drivers yeah. for USB. So they're the, probably the, one of the few guys that uh, actually uh, do killer stuff over USB. Yeah, they make good freaking hardware. Um, but yeah, I mean, Usually, if you don't write drivers, makes the product cheaper, and say, you know, we'll have fun if you just do two or three tracks. But I think yeah. any of your main companies, you know, your Motus, yeah. your obviously RME, you, who else is doing USB stuff? So Antelope, you know, most of them. Although I technically haven't used the Antelope, I have friends that have it. A couple of the little love hate relationship, but not related to that part of things. Uh, but they've said it, it works fine. You know, I think those companies that are really the good ones are making their own drivers and they're making things work really well. Yeah. You know, we're st still PCI. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, PCI is the most solid uh, in terms of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's, Yeah, I've never had a problem. You know, um, I think like in, in USB is more common to have dropouts. I mean, I don't think we ever had a dropout in PCI. We just you know just drop on all channels suddenly. Not that I can recall. No, you know so. I mean, unless I muted something. Yeah. <laughs> you know so. I mean, we'll we have to test it at some point. You know, with Thunderbolt, see how that well, fares. Well, that'll you know? be the big thing next year, and we yeah. will. I'm gonna film every single part of that process, including me probably cussing. I hate this. Who builds time. this? Yeah. <laughs> Who buys this shit? You know. You know it doesn't uh, work. <laughs> but the, the, the move is going to be made to a new computer and a new I.O. Yeah. Very begrudgingly. Oh, gosh. Very begrudgingly. But it's going to happen. That'll be next year. Too many new things right now. My brain can't handle it. I mean, with all of that new gear, the Electra's new, uh, what else? The other comps back in here, all this stuff hooked. I don't even know what to do right now. Too many options. Too many options. How are we doing? Uh, yeah, hungry. pretty good. Um... So yeah, yeah Chiefs game on. Yeah, know. BGE also says that keeping a separate for the print is always a good safety move to say, yeah, of course. Yeah, yep. Because then you don't have two interfaces talking to each other, which always which gives uh, issues. I did for a long time, yeah. remember? Yeah. I had an aggregate device with the Apogee and the Motus. And when it worked, it worked, it was okay. Yeah, but... When it didn't, it oh, was yeah. a nightmare. Yeah. And any given day, it would not work. Yep. So that's when the test of this using the separate laptop and it just sits. I actually had this desk built with a ledge back there to put the <laughs> laptop on and the cables permanently go back to it. Yeah. So, so and it works rather well. Cool. I guess uh, we covered a lot today. So should we play it? Should we play it out here? Yeah. One, uh, one more time. Okay. Let me make sure that the now we've talked about the Apogee. Let's make sure it's you know doing its thing. And nope. It didn't. 
Uh, that that and this is an unusual thing. This issue I'm having right now yeah. with the Apogee, which I don't know. I'm just resetting core audio. This is not a normal thing. That thing is usually bulletproof. There we go. Okay. So you guys, everyone, thanks for joining us. Let's go. We still got GoPro. Let's go to the GoPro. Let's let's play this thing out. And, and that is what? That's four. I'll tell okay. you what. Hold on. I want to pose one question before we do yeah. that. You'll go to four. We are thinking about, we have a couple live streams planned for the rest of the year. We have one guest, and I'm just trying to solidify the date, which I kind of have. But if this part is interesting, we're thinking about trying to mix one more of these tunes that we have sometime this coming week. Would you like us to do another one of these with the next song next Sunday? Is that interesting? Yes or no? We'll give it a couple seconds. Now I need the, like the game show music. Ooh, yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> Well, uh, BG One, go says go for it, and then um, or if if you're watching this late, how about live streaming the mix? Yeah, sure. You know, yeah. Someday I got too many connections going on that I got to deal with right now. That yeah, not not next week. Once I've sussed all of this out, we've been lucky right now, except for the damn apogee thing. And plus, I don't know the condition of some of these sounds in these old sessions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then the last question, what, what was your problem with ADOT, by the way? <laughs> Getting more than one to sync consistently, yeah. Yeah, right? And those, the, especially using the BRC, how many times, why is it syncing? Why, why is it syncing? Yeah, yeah. Didn't have that problem with the D88s. Yeah. Well, we did, like, live shows. That when we would pre-laptop, we always used D88s instead of the ADATs. Especially if I needed more than eight channels. Yeah. We did the Jimmy Kimmel session. We had everything originally on ADATs. And this was the uh, the 40 Deuce stuff when yeah. we did Kimmel. And then we took all our ADAT crap that we used at the shows, because you never knew it was going to work, transferred everything to a single DA88, yeah. and sat up behind me on the show. Yeah. On, I think I had it sitting on a chair. It wasn't even a <laughs> rack. Just on a chair. And I just turned around and went, boop, started the <laughs> da 88 And it worked perfectly. So that's my biggest bitch with the, the ADATs. It's, they just, I had many studios going back to the mid-90s that we all had ADATs and everything. And it was great because, oh, we get all these 16 tracks, 24 tracks. And when it worked, it was cool. But, man, I don't know how many times I wanted to throw the BRC against the wall because it just wouldn't sink. It drove me nuts. Yeah. All right. So we, so we get a yes or no on doing it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Week. Everybody says go for it. Yeah, we'll, I'll do a full start to finish live stream at some point once I have all my bugs worked out so my anxiety is lower where I can be creative. I don't think that's going to be this week. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Switching over to the... Yep, we're going to go to the GoPro. Hopefully it won't go out on us, so watch the, that. We'll see you guys in the next stream.
jingle bell, that's the jingle bell. 